Hello, and welcome to this episode of The Square. I'm Poonam Schallenberger, and I'm here with Luke Bromer, Senior Associate in our commercial sector. Welcome, Luke. Thanks, Poonam. So glad to have you here. We're going to talk a little bit about multifamily and how it shapes communities. But do you want to start off with a little bit about what you do? Of course. So I'm a project designer in our commercial studio. The last few years have been focusing primarily on multifamily and helping uh, establish that practice further and really dig into the details of the projects that we have coming in and building a good sense of space in the communities that we're in. Yeah. You know, we're based in Dallas, and whenever I look around, just cranes everywhere. Um, Can you talk to me a little bit about what you think is driving the multifamily business and kind of some of the trends that you're seeing? A lot of the the diversity we have here within North Texas especially brings a lot of different um, types of of people and companies to where it's a great hotbed for development, for business, and for technology. And so that brings lots of businesses as well as people, and uh, the amount of people moving into North Texas every day is is astronomical. And all those people need places to stay, places to rent, to buy, and especially right now with all of the you know ex- extensions of uh, how, high, high home prices, um, you know everyone's going to rent. And so there's a, a great place for people to, to have that traditional place, either in between homes or as they're coming out of college, um, to, to have that sense of home and that place. Yeah, that's not even just Dallas. I mean, we see these headlines across the country about the cost of living. But then I think also this trend of our new rhythm of life, of how we live and work. People want that fluidity. And I think that sometimes the density that multifamily mixed-use developments provide also maybe are driving some of the demand to move to some of these maybe more concentrated, higher amenitized spaces. Mm-hmm. A lot of times when you see in, in, in the suburbs, you might get a little bit more real estate, you might get a little more space, but everything's a lot more spread out, right? Yeah. So the good thing with, with the density of a multifamily project is you can get more people in one space, and so you have more shared spaces, you can uh, have more variety of places to eat or to, to work out, to go visit, um, and those, those uh, all build back to that project itself and help um, provide a little more variety for for each of those inhabitants as well. Yeah, I think I'm always like jealous of the people who can like go and work in a coffee shop, but you know, I would imagine that that's becoming more and more the expectation of today's workforce and upcoming workforce to kind of be able to say, I'm going to go work from home in the morning, then I'm going to go into the office and then quickly be able to come mm-hmm. back home, it really doesn't add a lot of value if you're having this like single multi or single family home super far away. You know, that fluidity is sort of deteriorated if you're not able to kind of live in these higher dense densified spaces. Yeah, the, the, the joining of, of work in, and, uh, and, and and play are, are important because the union right now that happens like post COVID as people have all had to work from home, we realize, Hey, that, that can work. As people are coming back to the office. There's still that flexibility that's desired. Right? So a lot of the, the new developments we're seeing, they're bringing both a, an opportunity for a live work unit where someone who has a small business or a small shop or wants to be able to have that storefront there, but also live in the same place can be. And those is th- those are a great opportunity for people to have, you know, one stop shop, literally for them to have their business and reside in. There's also, um, next to all of our you know main amenity spaces, there's usually a co-working space. Yeah. So people love that because there's a great place to go, touch down, like you said, in, in your local coffee shop or right there in your own apartment complex. There might be a small phone room, something you could check out so that if you want to take that private call, not be in your apartment, or if your roommate or your spouse or your partner is there and it's noisy, you can get out, get away and have that place to connect and have that sense of separation, right? Sometimes people love working from home, but it's also great if you can just unplug, you know, get that different environment, different setting in order to help spark curiosity, just to get some heads down time um, and actually get the work done. Yeah, it's interesting. So um, I hate saying the word pandemic, right? Like everyone, <laughs> everyone hates that word now, but... Forgive me for using it this one time. During that season, I guess, um, I had a lot of friends from, like, from San Francisco move to faraway places like Truckee um, or you know closer to Tahoe. And uh, so there was this like hour and a half, two hour long commute between their new place of where they were living in the city. And it's because there was a sort of like, oh, I guess we're just, we're just home now. Mm-hmm. But I think in more recent years as we've 
sort of come back to normal life and maybe a new normal of, hey, you know what, I'm going to go to work on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays, but then, or maybe on, I'm going to go in for half a day on Friday, and then I want to be able to come meet up with my friend for dinner. Our life has become so fluid and seamless, and there, I, there's just kind of this pressure for more and more of that. I always wonder, like, well, there, is there like this return back to city centers and to co- urban cores, or how, what, how is that affecting? where we live, I would imagine that would be coming back to city centers and bringing back more multifamily living. I, I think it is. It really is depending upon um, each market, right? Mm-hmm. So, but we, we've seen, especially like you're saying, in that pandemic realm where people were you know, om- almost escaping from the cities to go elsewhere, but a lot of those places have grown and developed. And as people have realized, hey, we can have that flexibility some of those, you know, not so populated places have become populated, mm-hmm. and then, um, you know, even the the denser metroplexes have become even more dense, mm-hmm. and so there is those higher densities of people that are are causing people to, to 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 be brought back into those places in a way that requires more intentional, purposeful development that isn't just density for density's sake or space for space sake or just to like check the box on we have this many square feet of office, we have this many residents, but actually having a placemaking development. Right, because you're designing, like you said, so much more than just where we live, right? It's where people are living, where they're working. You might even invite someone over for a meeting in your lobby or something like that. I think that the multifamily space is such an interesting one, and it's different than other typologies in the ways that it can shape a community. Corporate spaces sort of tend to belong to the employees that work there, or maybe the ground floor has like a coffee shop that you're allowed to go into if you'll get past security or whatever, right? But multifamily spaces are different in the way that they impact the character and mm-hmm. trajectory of a neighborhood. Can you talk to me a little bit about that? Yeah. So the 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 big thing that we always focus on with any multifamily development is you have to remember it's personal, right? Not only in an office development, you might say, okay, we have to think about each of the people coming in, but like you said, it's tr- it's very transient. They're there eight to five. They're there, you know, in, just in the afternoon. They're me- they're Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. With a multifamily unit or with any kind of home, it's it, it is it is their bedrock. That is their anchor for the day, right? It's so always that's where on. They, they yeah. wake up. That's where they go to sleep. That's where they might go grab lunch. They might you know bring a friend over. They might have their family there. Um, they might have multiple roommates. And so that is a place for people to to rest, to recharge, to find activity in. And it's something that has to be really cultivated around um, <clears throat> those functions a little bit better because. Uh, otherwise, it just it, beca- it can become very sterile, right? And so that personal aspect is really important, and the the activities that happen in there are twenty four seven, right? So I think the other thing that's really interesting about multifamily spaces is that when you look at it, you can kind of almost see the community hap- like happening in the future of it happening. What I mean by that is like. It's where you're like, okay, kids are coming in. That's going to affect the sort of investment into the school district or the quality of that school district, where the grocery stores end up coming. And while I think corporate facilities can can do some of that as well, I think that there's such a, like you said, a personal community component to multifamily or to any sort of residential development. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting is that there's also sort of this like – concurrent conversation that seems very like temporal. It's like, oh, well, here's what's trendy. Here's what the amenities they're they're looking for. And at the same time, you're planning for what this neighborhood's going to look like or what this what this building can do for this neighborhood in the next 20 years. How do you balance that? So yeah, that's, that's a great question. And I, I think the, the, the benefit of that too has to come and align with the developer and the shareholders for that property, right? So it is... It is ba- about finding the right density for each project, and that's going to make sure that that developer that that project can pencil out. But they're always thinking beyond just you know the, the the four lines of their property. They're thinking, okay, how can I tie into the urban fabric across the street? Like what is happening, you know, down you know a, a block away, or it, it's it's going to be happening, you know, uh, you know, just up the street in ten years. And so a lot of the places we're working on right now, especially within Dallas 
are areas that have been you know gentrifying in some some set state but also have a lot of room for growth and so you know you you see you see clusters of density that um, will provide great amenities, but a lot of times there's a lot of opportunities where you might, there's a lot of unknown, right? To where you can have that open space to like plug in a retail store, to plug in, um, you know, uh, the, the grocery or something like that. And that, that's always a huge, huge pull. Um, you know, you think about any time you're going to look, you know, when you're looking for an apartment, it's like, where's the closest grocery store? Right. Am I going to have to like spend 30 minutes finding a parking spot afterwards to then take my groceries up? Or can yeah. I walk there? Yeah. Right. And yeah. so that walkability and that tra- that transient nature is really important for the person in each of those places as well. Yeah. Because the amenities, some of them are enduring, right? Yeah. There's some qualities that, like you mentioned, I, we're always going to want to know how close that grocery store mm-hmm. is or how far it is from your office, some of that. But, um, <clears throat> you know, some of these other ones that seem to be newer and then it, it's not that dissimilar from what we've seen in corporate settings as well, where it's like, hey, everybody's got a ping pong table. It's like now no one – like who's using that ping pong? Maybe people are using it. But similarly, like in the work – or in a multifamily setting – Okay, there's this huge expectation that there'd be phone rooms and places to do co-working and all of that. You know, that's certainly meeting the need now, but it sounds like you need to also plan for what lifestyle habits and trends can look like mm-hmm. in 10 or 15 years, yeah. too, yeah. and how it shapes the community. What about the design? How can the design of a multifamily or any sort of building really kind of shape the fabric of the streetscape. So one of the key contributors I think that's different when it comes to multifamily versus office is that it's all about the function inside, right? There's a lot more variability when it comes to an office space to where you might have open, closed meeting rooms. When it comes to multifamily, you have a very set uh, program. And whether that is a studio, a one or two bedroom, you always have, you know, your bedroom, your living space. You want to have that open, open to the exterior, and those locations of where windows are, where balconies are, really define the facade. Mm-hmm. And as you look around a lot of the buildings, um, it can be very repetitive, right? And so, what what I think is most important to have some distinction on that is materiality. So, what we try to do is, as we look at projects, is how can we tie in to the local context. We don't want to bring something in that might be trendy or that we just love because from a design or aesthetic standpoint, it wants to fit in the neighborhood it's in. Um, So so pulling from the neighborhood from textures, colors, um, what kind of scale is happening there too. So a lot of times we'll try to bring in some type some type of masonry because it helps give permanence you know the the scale and the and the and the movement of that um, helps at least provide uh, you know, a, a sense of what you see typically in a Texas home. You know, you have the mas- stone or masonry on the front. It helps bring down some scale. It shows sophistication. It shows, it shows that, 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 that rigidity that you want to have. And that can tie in and help that person feel more like they have a sense of place there as well as a sense of ownership as well. Yeah, I think you... In many ways, right, we, there's I, – like I live in a neighborhood that's, a, I guess, a historic conservation neighborhood. Mm-hmm. And there still is that one house that I'm like, <clears throat> how did this happen? Because it doesn't look like the, it doesn't look yeah. like the rest of them at all, right? And uh, so I, when you're designing a, a, a multifamily space and it's in a sort of transitioning neighborhood or one that's kind of still finding its identity, how do you go about that process? I think it's, it's all about – how can you look to the legacy that was there or what once was, but also then look to the future? So you have to really toe the line between both, right? If it's stuck in the past, then, you know, it might be uh, helpful for a, a bit, but it, it, are people going to be interested or want to go there? If it's too trendy, it could be, uh, man, this is almost an eyesore or it's not something that people are drawn to in that sense. Or if it is trendy, it, it could be out in five or 10 years. So it's the it's the melding of the two. It's 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 respecting what was and kind of drawing to, the, to what could be. And also, you, you don't really know what's going to happen in that space until the people that inhabit it fill the space, right? Mm-hmm. And that's the extra piece that kind of brings the magic to those places as well. It still has to work for the people. Correct. Yeah. And you you mentioned this sort of like towing the line because um, it's like on TikTok or on, I don't know how to TikTok, so um, but just, sure, just to sure. be totally yeah. okay. clear, um, <laughs> but like on social media, there's this sort of trend of like how this like extreme minimal look is less in vogue now and now there's this 
other sort of aesthetic that's maybe more preferred. But it's it's these extremes that seem to sort of not st- stick around for a while. Do you have any good examples of projects that you've worked on recently that kind of show how you're capturing the spirit of a neighborhood, but then also planning for what it could possibly be? Yeah. So so quickly on, on even just as you're talking about finishes too, mm-hmm. you think about, you know, the 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 snapshot that that project occurs right is going to be a semblance of the time and era of that location right but you have to think beyond of okay whether it's an all white or all wood or you know bright colors or muted colors you know we we have to make a decision at some point right yeah and i think i think when when thinking through that too it's important to find something that can can speak to its time but also be timeless and so that's that's a, a very uh, careful line to walk, right? But I think it's important for us to make sure that it's not just run of the mill or it's you know all white because some of that too can be can be stark. So we want to have some color and depth and variation that can have that sense of place and also be def- a defining moment for that. And you know that that hopefully that that building is going to have a lifespan for decades to come. And you know there could be a refresh that could <clears throat> happen in the future. I think specifically on some projects that we've been working on, uh, one in particular is called the Juniper. It's located in Deep Ellum, and it's really located in uh, the historic warehouse district of the pre-war era. And there's so much history in that location um, over the years with a lot of um, derelict warehouse buildings that have had multiple functions over the years. And we're trying to bring new life to this. So the developers we're working with are are visionaries of trying to, to bring um, new uh, uh, inhabitants and, and life to those spaces. So we're pulling from that historic warehouse uh, lineage that's happening there, but also know that there needs to be a sense of a modern flair as well, because there's a lot of potential and future for this area as, as it has already been growing in the past decades. And so one of the things that we've been trying to do with that project is, is have two different forms within the building. We have more of the historic kind of orange red brick that helps pull back to uh, remember what was there and, and having the same uh, forms and colors of, of the neighborhood. And then we pull in a more uh, darker uh, iron spot brick that has more of that um, sophistication and uh, modern flair. And with the detailing of that too, it comes down to, okay, how are you treating the sill, the lintel, um, the, all, all the coursing and rows of the bricks? And so in the, in the more uh, new, modern, dark portion, we have these really cool brick frames um, that are articulated and pop out from around each window to help showcase those pieces and help, uh, you know, highlight the inhabitants within. And in, in the evening, it's all going to glow out and just bring extra life. And it's adjacent to uh, a park as well. And so uh, really in, in inhabiting and and bringing about life with the texture of the brick and the materials there is, is something that's going to be really successful. Yeah. You know, it's like so exciting to just hear. Whenever I speak to a designer or architect at Corgan, I get so excited because I can, I can just sense the sort of things that are hard to put your finger on. You talk about a sense of place and color and even the variation of brick materials that you've chosen and all of that. And we forget, well, I don't know if we forget, but it's hard to describe what sense of place is, but it really is kind of those details that are so different and Mm -hmm. memorable. I am that person who paints everything in my house white, but then it's like, this could be any, I mean, eventually there's some crazy stuff that gets put up on walls, but, but you're right. Like, how do you create a sense of place through these unique choices? What does that mean when someone says a sense of place? Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of it too, it's, it's not, um, necessarily marketable, right? Because it's not something you can say, oh, we've done X, Y, and Z. Uh, Most people aren't going to really identify or be able to pinpoint what it is. But I think it is, when when, with the the idea of sense of space, it really is a sense. When you walk into a space, you can, you can feel, okay, this feels like the right scale. I can see the proportion of the space. They might not identify those terms or see the the alignments, right? But there, there's a, a, a very much, uh, the intuitive human nature, of walking into into a space or inhabiting a space that can make you feel a part of it or make you feel like you shouldn't belong here. And so looking at at how we bring in as much natural light as we can into the space, the alignment of 
uh, bringing the outdoors in, having good relationship to both the living and the dining space and the bedroom. And so how those three speak to one another and making sure you're having the right privacy where you need to, you're opening up where you need to. And again, there's not going to be a one size fits all for every person. Mm -hmm. So someone might want to have the corner unit that's like tucked away. That's really quiet. And someone might want to be right there on the pool deck, ready to party at any moment. So you have to have both because we're all different. Right. And that's the beauty of it too, is that, um, it takes the whole village to create a very active and vibrant project. Yeah. It becomes its own sort of little community. Exactly. Earlier we were talking about how folks are moving back into urban cores and kind of like where are people living and what does the new rhythm of our life look like? And I think there's this sort of, at least in Dallas where we are now, and I would imagine in other places, you're seeing sort of these surrounding, very very close to downtown urban cores take off because, again, you can enjoy that fluidity. Deep Ellum is one of those neighborhoods that's really celebrated its recent growth in mm-hmm. nightlife, amenities, and restaurants, and it's entertainment. It's changed so much. So much, and so many new corporate buildings going in. And then even little pockets all around Dallas sort of finding new life. Any other examples of kind of where you're seeing this happen and, and how you might approach it from a design perspective? Yeah, so one of the other locations that we've seen a huge amount of growth is the Cedars, and that's just south of downtown, right? And the 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 key piece with that area is there's there's so much potential. There's already a few multifamily projects that have been built over the last decade there. Um, the one that we've been working on most recently is uh, on the old historic Ambassador Hotel site. So this is a hotel that was built in 1904. Um, it was known as one of the most um, historic and oldest hotels in Dallas. Um, it unfortunately burned down in 2019. But uh, we had the opportunity to work with a developer to, to reimagine that site um, as a multifamily project. Um, the original hotel actually had apartments as well. So it, it was able to almost bring back the same life that was once there over like, you know, 115 years ago, which is pretty remarkable. Yeah, cool. And in doing so, we had to maintain the form and shape of the existing hotel in the same location, right? Because it was part of the Landmark Commission, it was a historic property. And in doing so, we had to be very careful about the articulation of a basement on top, having stone and brickwork that wasn't maybe the exact replication of it, but it was it was celebrating and remembering the, the hotel in a way that could hopefully live on for 100 plus years again, right? Yeah. And so we had a mixture of both uh, stone and brick that could be articulated in a more vertical aspect um, as, as was outlined um, by the city requirements and as well was able to help harken back to a lot of the both uh, Louis Sullivan-esque of the original design that he he did, as well as the Spanish colonial version as it got remaked later in the 30s and 40s. And so we're just taking a modern flair on that, of being able to articulate those pieces, have um, spots that um, have the same form and texture of the masonry in the past, but bring it in a way that, you know, in, in the 2020s, it can, it can uh, stand the test of time, as well as, um, you know, be something that everyone can be proud of. So that one piece is, as we call, as we call the jewel, is right there on the corner there. And the rest of the buildings um, are, are a different sense and scale, but still have a very articulated base that bring the warmth and texture of that area. Um, and also uh, speak to the local context of the neighborhood that is very storied, has a lot of legacy, and we think is going to be an extremely successful project to be the the entry front door for the Cedars. Yeah. Luke, have you thought about selling bricks? Because <laughs> <laughs> So the story started because I can't remember if I was talking to you in our break room or if I was talking to somebody else, and somehow I was like, hey, Luke's doing a lot of cool stuff with brick. Was it you? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> And uh, can you just talk to me personally, like what attracts you to the material? What are some challenges of working with bricks? And like from a designer's perspective, when, like, what do you like about, about that specific material? Yeah. I mean, this is, this is so nerdy, but like, that's what we do as designers, right? It's like, it's all about the materials. That's, that's how a product is made. And that's what articulates one building from the next. So I, I think the, the beauty for me in brick is that it's, it has, I mean, it's literally from the earth, right? I mean, and the way they used to make it was, was literally just taking earth and clay and hardening it and baking it. Uh, and, 
and and creating those forms. Nowadays, as 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 we're pulling from um, each region, it's very much pulling and having the colors and textures of uh, of of the earth in that area. And so, it, it's a great opportunity to pull in literally a part of of that site but also to harken back to something that has been happening for centuries, right? Yeah, it's like a like a beautiful symbol of everything that multifamily is. It's personal because there's something mm-hmm. that's very like tactile tactile and human and like maybe craftsman about bricks heritage, but then also like you said just coming actually from the site and being of the place that it's live that's now going to yeah. be used I, in. I, I think the other cool thing too is that there's there's literally a million different types of bricks and colors and shapes even too. So you think about you know there's there's uh, you know the, the 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 modular brick there's the king brick that has different shapes and sizes. Uh, those are the two types of bricks we're usually mostly multifamily, but y- you can get bricks that are much longer and strung out um, that are are. are are beautiful in the way they can articulate and, and almost create like a, 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 sh- a shard or linear effect within the facade. And, and as you think about how that facade gets built actually by the mason, it is, it's even personal for him too. It's literally laid brick by brick. And so it's almost a labor of love and like, you know, putting on the mortar and laid, setting things in, getting the brick ties, getting everything aligned and all the recesses. And so it, it is, it takes a lot of skill as well for those contractors and masons to put things together in a way that, you know, showcases what's going to be happening both outside and inside that project. So is it more expensive to work with brick? Not necessarily. I mean, I think uh, it's it's cheaper than a siding product, but also you're getting more for that as well. Yeah. And you're allowing um, that piece to actually, uh, you know, speak a different language. And so I think in every project uh, in architecture, you have to deal with a budget and balance that. Um, but it's something that I think is important to help bring the permanence and, and break down that scale and show uh, the human quality that's going to happen within that project. So, so Louis Kahn was able to bring a lot of sophistication and and permanence within his buildings, and it was very cutting edge for his time. And he he spoke very highly of trying to honor and respect the materials that were there, not using it in a way that it wasn't supposed to be. So he was very true to the nature of how it was constructed, but also was very eloquent in the way that he applied it to a building and thought just as we were talking through today about not just putting a material to be a material, but actually to put it in a space that made sense to ground out a space, um, to bring it and, and, and actually to have uh, an extra texture and lifting where he needed to. Um, and so I think a lot of his projects um, bring about uh, a, a very emotional and, 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 and uh, evocative feelings when you, when you see or experience those projects because they are grounded in those locations, but also um, help bring back and tie back uh, to the context that they're in. Yeah. Luke, it's been so special talking to you today about bricks. And it's because I think, you know, you're you're able to articulate what, like you mentioned, we're able to walk into space. The, the average user walks into a space or walks past building. It's like feel something, but we can't tell you exactly why. And it's because someone like you has probably made very intentional decisions about materials and finishes and layout and all of those things so that we are able to have an emotional reaction or something that feels more human with something like brick, but we just don't know it. So thank you for sharing some of the magic of materiality with us. It's been great chatting with you. Thanks, Poonam. Yeah. And thank you for joining us. We'll see you the next time on The Square.